<laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so um, so let's go over to slavery real quick. I am showing it for legal reasons. Please take a look. Uh, basically, it just tells you that uh, you know trading or actually any investing. Investing in anything, investing in a little girl's lemonade stand outside is, is a high risk thing. So you should never invest more than you can afford to lose. Um, before deciding to trade, you should carefully consider your objectives, your financial situation, your needs, and your level of experience. Uh, what we're giving away today is, is general advice. It's not to take into account your objectives, your personal financial situation, or your personal needs. That's for an independent financial advisor to do for you. A past performance does not necessarily indicate future success. And a lot of these things probably won't even won't even uh, come into play for our next speaker. And let me tell you a little bit about him really quick, um, and, and then you then you'll you'll see why, and you'll be able to figure out which parts make sense and which part don't. Um, Dr. Jerry Allison is going to be joining us here today, and he's going to be talking about trading in 2023 and tax strategies for you. And again, a lot of you have asked asked about taxes, and this is a tax expert that we're bringing in with over 30 years of experiencing. Excuse me. With over 30 years of experience practicing accounting as a certified public accountant, he holds a doctorate in business administration and a master's degree in mathematics. So he's smart. Uh, he's an experienced educator, having taught at multiple universities and colleges. Again, super smart. Published several journals and conference pa uh, papers on business strategy through research, and he specializes in tax preparation and consulting for individuals involved in trading public securities. This is your guy, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Allison's here. Jerry, how are you today? I'm doing fine. How are you all doing? Very, very good. And doctor, we really appreciate you coming to do this for us. Believe it or not, we've You're had welcome. four days and at least five times a day, someone asks something about taxes and I'm like, just wait, just wait. Someone will be here. So yeah, I'll bet. It's, it's a very important topic that uh, people really need to take care of. And really, this is the time of year to actually do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you're having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, and it's it's a little cliche, but you know the, the doctor is in, so we'll we'll let you uh, we'll, we'll let you take over. All righty, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, excuse me, I do have a slight cough, so I may uh, end up coughing a little bit through this. So I apologize for that. Um, let's see, that should be you. Should guys should be able to see my screen now. And uh, this is a good time to be thinking about this stuff, um, as you all know trading is very psychological. You've got to be able to focus on trading, no matter what you're trading. If you're doing this for a living or a part, even a part of your living, and you're serious about it, you've got to be able to focus on it. And you don't need distractions. And one of those distractions, obviously, is taxes. And I've watched people over and over again start worrying about taxes in the middle of their trading strategy, and it just screws everything up. You've got to be able to come up with a set strategy for what you're doing and forget it. Let it go. Uh, have some things that you do maybe once a quarter or, or however, uh, however you set that strategy, but you don't need to be worrying about this stuff uh, day by day. So we're going to be talking about some tax strategies today that can help uh, you. Now, I will say here at the beginning, uh, and I was listening a little bit to the previous speaker, um, these strategies are for U.S. Uh, taxes. Uh, so uh, if you are filing or you're trading in, a, in another country somewhere, uh, this won't work for you. However, if you are living in another country other than the U.S. and uh, you are, uh, fi are trading through a, uh, um, a U.S. broker so that you have to file um, uh, U.S. tax return, these strategies will work for you. Matter of fact, I talked to somebody from Canada, uh, I think it was sometime this week, and uh, he's trading through U.S. brokers and therefore has to file a U.S. tax return. And so we talked about setting up um, an entity in here in the United States that we could employ some of these strategies and then his tax preparer back in Canada can actually uh, take the K-1s from that entity and uh, apply them to that tax return where he's going to file uh, part Canadian, part uh, uh, U.S. So anyway, so uh, for those of you who are trading through U.S. brokers, this will definitely hide or help you. Um, I'm going to put a link into the chat and hopefully one of the hosts will copy that over for everyone so that you can see it. And I will explain that link here uh, in a minute. 
So let's go ahead and talk about uh, my disclaimer. Everybody's got a disclaimer nowadays, got to make the lawyers happy. Uh, so let me just say this to the best of our knowledge, the information given in this presentation is accurate as of today's date. I did go through this uh, yesterday uh, or, or two days ago and make sure everything was right, modified a couple things, but uh, we want to make sure that we're giving you the most accurate information possible. And um, tax changes do happen constantly in the United States. And you may be watching Congress and saying, well, nothing's going to happen there. Well, the IRS actually has the, the leeway to change a few things. So just kind of keep up on, on things. Uh, matter of fact, one of those things was how mark to market uh, that election is made. And I'll talk about that later uh, in the, uh, the session here. But how uh, that was made, <clears throat> uh, they've changed it. And so it was a dramatic change, but the IRS did that uh, unilaterally. They did not need Congress's permission. Also, this pr presentation does not establish a professional or confidential relationship between you, me, or Traders Accounting. And Traders Accounting is not a law firm, uh, so the information provided here should not be construed as legal advice. Now, uh, I did not introduce my company all. I'm going to talk about that right now. Traders Accounting is actually... Um, an accounting firm for that's dedicated to people who trade uh, anything, quite frankly. We, we have pe clients that trade Forex, uh, futures, options, stock, cryptocurrency. Uh, we run the whole spectrum there. And we talk to them quite frequently about setting up structures and making sure that they can take advantage of a lot of the tax breaks in the U.S. tax code. Now, <clears throat> The website address there, that is a little bit complicated, and that is the address that I put into the chat a little bit ago. So hopefully that is carried over so everyone can see it. And the reason that is significant is not just to contact us, but there is a free ebook that you can download uh, that is uh, that talks about a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. There are some other things there. Uh, that it will talk about. And you can certainly download that and have that as a reference guide, certainly. Um, our phone number at the office is 800-938-9513. And uh, certainly give us a call uh, if, you, if you need help in this area. And you can contact us by email as well at learn at tradersaccounting.com. Now I'm going to put this back up uh, towards the end of the presentation so that you can uh, copy it down or do whatever you need to do with it. And of course, um, if you're allowed to, to review this, uh, then certainly you can go back and look at the, the, uh, uh, the, the tape of this thing and, and go back through it. But anyway, let's going to go ahead and get into our information. Now, trading, if you're going to trade seriously in the United States, and you want to maximize your tax benefits, then you need to treat it like a business. Uh, quite frankly, uh, if you're going to be that serious about trading, then it, it, you have to look at it like a business. And I always talk to people and they think as traders, they, they concentrate upon the trading side, which is something you really need to do. I've emphasized that already. Uh, today, it's very you've got to you've got to bring the money in from trading. You got to get the gains in there. But in a business, you have to think about other areas as well. And so, you really need to expand your thinking a little bit to treat uh, trading as a business. And you've got to be concerned about cash flow. And when you're talking about different strategies and you're talking about different gurus and you're talking about different philosophies of trading, things like that, you are talking about cash flow because you're talking about getting it in. But there is a second side to that as well. You not only need to concentrate on getting money in, but you've got to keep on, keep on it not flowing out. In other words, you have to watch those expenses. Um, just kind of a, an example outside of trading is I, I know somebody in Iowa, I've been doing some accounting for him for decades, and um, <clears throat> he has a tremendous business. I mean, millions of dollars every year flow in, but he has no clue and probably isn't making a profit. And the reason is he has no idea about the money, how it's flowing out. And so if you're going to be a trader, 
and you want to maximize your benefits, not just tax benefits, but business benefits, you have to concentrate not only on the cash coming in, getting the gains from the trading coming in, you got to watch those expenses going out. And one of those expenses obviously is taxes. And so we want to make sure that we can minimize our taxes or at least use the tax code effectively to make sure we're getting everything back that we can from the government. Also, here's a second business tip. And you learned about this in Business 101, or at least I used to teach it to, to my students. Make financial decisions based on business needs and not the tax code. Now, if you need, a, you need a new computer, go out and buy a new computer for your trading business. Fine, do that. that. That will pay for itself because you're using it. But don't just go out and buy something for a tax deduction. You will almost always screw yourself over, quite frankly. You always, almost always lose money on the proposition. Um, a story I had for several years ago, I was doing some work with a uh, an auto repair repair mechanic, and uh, he had a very good business. was was just really doing super well in the business, but he wanted to save on taxes. So he came to me in December and said, "Hey, I want to buy this twenty thousand dollar tire machine." I said, "Okay, uh, that'd be a great deduction. We can write that off. You probably about get about six thousand dollars back in refund as a result of that." And then I asked him, how often are you going to use it? And he said, well, maybe once or twice a year. Um, and so this thing is never going to pay for itself? Well, probably not. So he was going to spend $20,000 to save $6,000, which makes absolutely no sense. He lost, would have lost $14,000 in the process. And that's the type of stuff that you don't want to do. Uh, with the tax code, you don't want to get so obsessed with taxes that you go out and spend money to avoid the taxes and then lose the difference, quite frankly. And in his case, lose that $14,000. He didn't do it, and which was very smart of him. So um, you got to think of this as a business. One thing I would suggest to you um, is that you go to the IRS website and download Publication 550. Publication 550, um, just go to irs.gov. There's a search bar in the upper right-hand corner and type in Publication 550, and it will bring it up. And you can read it in an HTML uh, format, or you can download it to your computer in a PDF format. It is a rather big document. It's about 70-something pages, but it deals with all types of investing. I mean, it talks about dividends. It talks about interest, uh, original issue discounts, bonds, stocks, options. Everything is there. And everything we're going to be talking, a lot of what we're talking about today is going to be there as well. So that would be a great reference uh, for you to get to, to read about taxes and make sure you're up on everything uh, so that you've got that. So having said that, here's where we're going to go today. So I want you, by the time we get done today, to be aware of all your tax and your protection options. It's not only a good idea to maximize your tax benefits, it's also a great idea to protect your assets as well those trading assets, and you don't want to do something that's going to jeopardize them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to, really this is divided into three parts. We're going to talk about trader tax status. And trader tax status actually applies to every trader. I don't care what you're trading, uh, you, can, you can utilize trader tax status. So we'll focus on everybody here at the beginning. We will also then talk about entities. Um, do you need an LLC? Do you need a corporation? Uh, how to structure that? How many people do you need involved? All kinds of stuff like that. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And then we will talk about the mark to market election. Um, now, some people get that confused with trader tax status, and they're not the same. Mark to market is only for stock and options traders. Uh, if you're trading Forex or if you're trading futures, you cannot have mark to market on those things. Now, if you're trading multiple things, if you've got, if you're trading stocks and options and you're trading futures or cryptocurrency or Forex or whatever, you can have mark to market on your stock and options, but you can't do it on, on the others. Although cryptocurrency is a little bit doubtful, but we can work, worry about that at another time.
So let's go ahead and start off and we'll talk about trader tax status. Trader tax status is a choice. And notice that I have highlighted that word choice. You can do it or not. It is not something that you have to talk to the IRS about. You don't have to file any paperwork with them. It is a choice that allows you or any entity to deduct trading expenses provided the criteria are met. We'll talk about the criteria here in a little bit. So what do you mean? What are we talking about trading expenses? Well, let's think about that. The, the uh, brokerage fees the, for, the, for a trade are already embedded in the trade. So those are automatically deducted. So we're not gonna be concerned about those. But if you have any advisory fees, uh, from a broker, if you have any margin interest that you're using, um, if you have short, short and lo short locate fees, if you have to pay dividends on short positions, um, these are all deductible. But outside of the broker, um, if you belong to a chat room or if you if you pay for any education like you're doing right now, or if you uh, <clears throat> Uh, buy a computer, you have office furniture, or uh, anything, if you buy books or anything like that that helps you trade or helps you trade better, those are all deductible. And we want to make sure that you can uh, deduct those. Now, you may ask, okay, well, why are there criteria? Well, because the IRS wants you treating this as a business. <clears throat> and that's why I led off with talking about the business stuff a little bit ago. Because if you want to be able to deduct your expenses, if you want to maximize your tax code benefits, then you've got to treat this seriously. And though, so you need to meet these criteria. Well, what are the criteria? Well, <clears throat> if you look at publication 550, the criteria there are extremely vague. And it's my personal opinion, the IRS writes that stuff so it is vague so that their agents can go and interpret it however they want to, whenever they want to. And so what we have to do in a lot of cases is go back to court cases and say, okay, what do court cases show? Who's won and who's been allowed trader tax status because they've won actually in court? And so one of the things that has a court has said, there need to be 720 plus trades per year. Um, according to one uh, suit um, against the commissioner, the IRS commissioner, the court found that if you're making over 720 trades a year, you are a very active trader. And so you are actually doing that uh, quite heavily. Now, a lot of people ask me, what do trades constitute? Is it just uh, you buy something for a thousand buy a thousand shares and then you sell a thousand shares it's two traders at one trade that's actually two trades if that happens to get broken up in lots let's say five different lots you've got five different trades now so for a lot of people 720 trades a year is not that difficult particularly if are you are using some type of uh, algorithmic trading you have a computer program or AI or something that's helping you trade, and you can do it quite quickly, that 720 is very minuscule right now. So that's the first criteria. Second criteria, there is trading in over 75% of the trading days per year. So you have to be active most of the year in trading. So <clears throat> there are about 250 trading days in a year. So you need to be trading in at least 188, 189 of those days somewhere. You have to trade something. Could just be one trade, but you've got to be doing something as far as trading. And that shows uh, your activity. Now, these two things, <coughs> excuse me, if the IRS were to ever come in and say, well, do you meet the criteria or you want to show you meet the criteria, all you have to do is give them your broker statements. They can add up and see if there's 720 trades there. And they can look at the days that you were trading, the, the, the broker statements and your 1099 that you get from your broker are perfect. Uh, uh, it's perfect evidence for justifying these two things. However, there is one other uh, uh, qualification. You have to have over 500 hours of trading, research, and education. <clears throat> Now, trading, fine, research, okay, but also education. What you're doing right now, quite frankly, constitutes education. You go watch a YouTube video. 
there's education. You go read a book about trading or a magazine or something like that, a newsletter, you're doing education. So this should not be a whole lot either that you should actually have to put in. Now, how do you prove this though? Well, you prove it by keeping a log. And this is something that you would have to go out of your way a little bit. You can kind of think about this like a mileage log for driving your car vehicle for business purposes. And so you'd want to keep a log of uh, each day, uh, what you did and how long it took, or you could keep the actual times. There is no set format for this. Just make the attempt to keep some documentation about what you did. Um, <clears throat> And uh, people ask me, well, uh, will the IRS challenge it uh, because it doesn't have a set format? Well, the, the concept that you took the effort to go to this effort, to this link to actually keep this data goes a long way with them. And they can't really dispute it a whole lot. So you can keep this on pencil and paper. You can keep it into a spreadsheet. You can use a, a database if you want, however you want to, as long as you can pull it up if the IRS ever questions it. So trader tax status is a choice that you make to deduct those expenses. You can choose, you can do it or not do it. Um, and but you need to keep these criteria here and maybe do a little bit of effort. So if the IRS ever does come in, then you've got this evidence. You don't have to send this stuff to them. You just have to keep it on hand because if they ever do come in, a lot of times they don't. So but you need to have it there. And of course, the tax savings depends upon your current tax bracket. So um, <clears throat> if you're in the 39 percent or 30 35% tax bracket, let's go there. You're going to be paying a lot more in taxes, obviously, than somebody in the 24% tax bracket. And so your savings will be more uh, dollar wise because you are in that bracket. So some people ask me directly, well, how much money can I save? Well, it depends upon your tax bracket. And the, the higher you are, the higher tax bracket you are in, the more you will save by doing this stuff. Now, I mentioned that any entity can do this. You can do this personally. You can do this through a partnership, an S corporation, C corporation. However, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, but anything can do this. However, I do have a warning <clears throat> because this is where some people get into trouble or can get into trouble. And so this is something, if you don't pay anything, attention to anything else during this uh, session here, please pay attention to this. A person deducting trading expenses on their personal return must use the Schedule C. Now, what happens, the gains from trading, whether they're capital gains or ordinary gains, we won't get into that right now, those goes on different forms. They don't go on the Schedule C. So the only thing a trader puts on the Schedule C are the trading expenses, your education stuff and your margin stuff and your computer and all that stuff, all the expenses. Now, what that does, here's some following issues that happen. First, your audit risk is increased. It has nothing to do with trading per se. It actually has to do with the Schedule C. Quite frankly, individuals who put a Schedule C onto their return um, <clears throat> increase their audit risk. It doesn't matter what the reason. Um, we had a year ago, the IRS came in and wanted to do a serious examination of part of a uh, client's return. And it was a Schedule C that they wanted to look at. Now, ironically, it had nothing to do with trading, the Schedule C. The, the Schedule C they, the IRS wanted to examine was about real estate. And so <clears throat> when you start middling, peddling around with that Schedule C, your audit risk is increased. Almost every audit I've ever been involved in or serious examination by the IRS, it's involved a Schedule C. So you do, by, by using a Schedule C on your return to deduct those trading expenses, you do increase your audit risk a little bit. Second of all, the home office deduction may not be obtainable. There are situations, if you do this on a Schedule C, more than likely, you will not be able to use the home office deduction, quite frankly. There are cases where you might 
but those are few and far between. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, for most of our clients uh, that trade on Schedule C uh, and deduct their expenses on a Schedule C, they can't take the home office deduction. And so uh, we and we warn them about that. Um, but uh, that may not be obtainable. Now, keep in mind that one, because that, that's going to be an important one here in a little bit. Number three, there's no asset protection. If you trade as an individual, then if somebody were to sue you personally, everything, your house, your car, and your trading assets <clears throat> are open to that lawsuit. Um, so uh, we'll talk about LLCs in a little bit, how to help with that. But uh, uh, trading as an individual uh, creates a bit of a... a a not a liability, but a, a risk <clears throat> for your trading assets. Number four, it's difficult to justify having a W-2 job and being an active or an active trader. <clears throat> now, the IRS in the thought publication 550, their criteria, I mentioned that's a little bit vague. They talk about how you need to rely on this as income or in, in full or in part for income. But we have found that they really don't like it if you've got it, if you personally have a job. Now, your spouse who's not involved in trading, that's that's not a big deal. But if you have a W-2 job or even another Schedule C where you're earning income and you're trying to <clears throat> trade, the IRS has a little bit of a difficulty with that. So now you've got a double whammy here. Not only are you using a Schedule C, it could be a problem. But now you've got a conflict with your W-2 job as well as being an active trader. So that can be a problem. So I want you to understand trader tax status is a viable strategy to use and deduct the, you can deduct those expenses um, personally on the Schedule C, but you do have risks associated with it as well. Um, <clears throat> not so much with entities. And that's actually what we're going to talk about right now. We're going to talk about entities. Now, there's several different types of entities. There's sole proprietorship, single member LLC, general partnership, limited partnership, multi-member LLC, S corporation, LLC, S corporation, C corporation, LLC, C corporation. We're not going to deal with all of these because we can boil this down and eliminate some of these, quite frankly. <clears throat> um, if you're thinking about protection for your trading assets, uh, in other words, you want to avoid somebody being able to get to it through a lawsuit or something like that, then you want to keep in mind the LLC stuff. Um, S corporation and C corporation also apply, but uh, <clears throat> LLCs give you that protection for your trading assets. Now, let's go ahead and start eliminating some of these. A sole proprietorship. Now, that's just using your Schedule C um, on your tax return. Uh, as we talked about in the last slide, so you're just deducting expenses as a Schedule C, that is a sole proprietorship. Single member LLC, except for the, uh, the asset protection, they don't do anything for a trader. And what happens with a single member LLC, it puts it right back on the Schedule C of your personal return where you don't want it. So um, you still have the headaches there with um, the Schedule C being used as well as a possible W-2 trading conflict. So we generally do not go this route. <clears throat> uh, we don't advise people do this, although some of our clients do, and that's fine. Um, but we, we make sure that they understand the risks involved. Now, the type of entity that's right for you depends upon your situation. Um, Mostly, we advise people to set up a multi-member LLC. And the concept here, and let me kind of back up for saying that, the concept that we want to do is we want to get the trading off your personal tax return because we want to eliminate that Schedule C conflict. And we want to eliminate the W-2 schedules or the trading conflict. We want to eliminate all these conflicts that the IRS has with trading. And so that means forming an entity that gets it off of your personal return. <clears throat> so now we've narrowed it down really to partnerships, S corporations, and C corporations. <clears throat> Excuse me again. So <clears throat> which of those entities right for you depends upon your situation. And don't think that what we're doing here is coming up with blanket answers. We can't. Um, I advise people all the time. And... Uh, 
a lot of times we go with a multi-member LLC, quite frankly, because that's the simplest way to do things. And you can start building a foundation there and to work with later. And uh, well, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, the S corporation, it's a little more tricky to use. Um, the C corporation, that's very tricky to use and do it right. Um, but there are situations where we would we would advise people to do that. So um, that is something that you need to talk to a tax professional about doing before you start setting up any type of entity. Now, like I mentioned, we generally mention recommend a multi-member LLC to start off with. <clears throat> and I am one to give you all the pros and the cons. I want you to know everything. I want you to think about it. I want you to do your research before you actually do anything or set anything up. Because the worst thing that can happen to both of us, quite frankly, is a client goes out, person goes out, they set this, stu set this stuff up, these entities up, they set it up wrong, and then we have to fix it. And so it's, it's a waste of time and a waste of money on both sides. So I'm one that's going to give you <clears throat> all the information I can, uh, both pros and the cons, and then let you decide. decide. Um, but I want you to have full knowledge. So first thing, before we get to the pros of doing a multi-member LLC, the cons are you're going to have a yearly fee. And by the way, that's true with an S Corp or a C Corp. Uh, more than likely, although it's not true in every state, but more than likely every state you're going to have a yearly fee to renew the registration of the business inside that state. <clears throat> there are a handful of states uh, that do, once you pay the fee, all you have to do is keep the paperwork up every year. You don't have a yearly fee, but there, those, there are a few of them. Um, you also have a tax prep fee. Same thing with uh, <clears throat> in the multi-member LLC, that's a partnership return. Um, S corporation, an S corp return, C corporation, C corp return. <clears throat> and, and here's the one that some people get shocked at, but I want you to understand, you have to set up brand new broker accounts. And you have to set it up as a business account, which means they generally increase the fees on you. Now, there's a couple ways to actually move around some of those fees. If you're doing like real-time quotes, you keep your personal account, a uh, broker account that you're getting the free time quotes on, but you do the trading through the business account. So you have two, two accounts. You use the personal account for the free stuff that you can get, but actually do the trading uh, through the business account. So there's a couple ways to, to do that. So those are the cons, really. Uh, so you've got some increased fees here. Let me talk about the pros, though. First of all, <clears throat> you do get the asset protection. Now, a regular partnership, just setting up a partnership in your state, doesn't work. Uh, that does not give you asset protection. It has to be a multi-member LLC or an S-Corp or a C-Corp, because the LLC part of that or the S Corp or C Corp part give you the asset protection. If you just set up a general partnership, you have no asset protection. And if one of the partners gets sued, then that can go into the partnership. Um, so <clears throat> you don't have the wall there that protects you. Second of all, there's a choice in taxation methods. And I really like this one because when you form an LLC, and by this is true with the single member LLC as well, you get to choose how it's going to be taxed uh, because an LLC is actually a state creation. It's not a, an IRS creation. And so we have to fit it into the tax code somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> so when you first form an LLC, you have 75 days to decide if you want to be taxed in a different way than the default. Now, the default for a single member LLC the default is what's called a disregarded entity, but it's actually the same thing as a sole proprietorship. It puts it right back on this Schedule C, and that's what we don't want. Um, the default with a multi-member LLC is a partnership return, <clears throat> but you still have the LLC features. And so you'll be that you've in most of our clients, we have them being taxed as a partnership. Later on, <clears throat> Uh, you can choose, actually, at the beginning of a year, you can choose to change your taxing method. So uh, we generally start people off with a multi-member LLC, the very simple way of doing things. But let's say in two years, they're doing really, really well. 
they've got solid income, then we can actually file an election with the IRS to have that business taxed as an S corporation or as a C corporation. There are ways to do that, and, and there's reasons to do that. Um, if you're thinking about like 401ks or medical insurance, things like that, <clears throat> you really, it's much easier to do things in a, in a uh, S corporation than it is a partnership. Matter of fact, 401ks are out in a partnership because uh, you're not getting earned income there, which 401ks depend upon. You're only getting investment income. And so uh, we have to convert if, if people are doing really well and we want to start setting up 401ks, things like that, then we convert over to an S corporation to make sure uh, they set up a salary, which then is earned income, and then they can start with the 401k stuff. <clears throat> so you have a choice in taxation methods. You can actually move around, and if the tax code changes, you can actually change uh, the taxing method for the entity. So it's really a cool thing. Number three, a reduction in IRS scrutiny. This is one that most, some of you probably will like. Um, IRS really scrutinizes individual returns. So if you have something, even the slight bit out of whack, uh, they're usually contacting you, wanting you to explain it. Uh, <clears throat> most times when there's some type of an examination, the IRS is going after an individual. Um, particularly that, that Schedule C um, and, and, and for any business. But once you get this thing off into another tax return, like a partnership return or an S-corp return, the IRS tends to leave things alone a little bit. And by the way, those uh, criteria for trader tax status may may not be as important on a, an entity level as what they are on the individual level. So that's another issue there. <clears throat> so by uh, getting things off into a partnership or an S corp, we, we actually reduce the IRS scrutiny considerably and they tend to leave things alone. Number four, I mentioned a little bit ago that if you invest as an individual or even as a single member LLC on your personal tax return, you really can't utilize the home office deduction. There's very rare circumstances when you can. Um, it doesn't work very well. But if you set off, if you're in a partnership or an S corporation, doesn't matter what you're making, doesn't matter about anything, you can take that home office deduction right away. And we can write that off on the return. And that can be usually 1200 to you know, several thousand dollars a year. Um, just in deduction. So that can be a huge deduction for you as a trader. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> Number five, it solves the W-2 trading issue. I mentioned that if you try to do this on your personal return <clears throat> and you, you're trying to work a full-time job at W-2 and you're trying to trade, the Kairos doesn't like that. Well, what this does by getting the, the, uh, the trading business off into a uh, partnership or an S corporation, um, it solves that problem because now on your personal return, you've got a W-2, your W-2 job, but it also looks like you're just investing in the standalone business. So it kind of legitimizes the business. It uh, really cleans up your tax return and, and uh, makes things a whole lot better uh, for you personally. Now, one we haven't talked about yet, we will in a little bit, but with the mark to market election, there's a kind of a dilemma between long-term and short-term stocks. Um, <clears throat> if you try to do the mark-to-market -market election on the personal side, uh, then the IRS is going to want to tax your long-term uh, holdings, which long-term is anything more than one year, the same as the short-term. And they want to take away the long-term capital gains benefits. So by setting up an entity, we can actually take care of that dilemma by putting all the short-term trading into the LLC, the multi-member LLC, and we can keep the long-term stuff on our personal side so that the IRS doesn't see that conflict. So long-term's on the personal side, short-term's on the, um, the LLC side or the partnership or S corporation side. It's off your personal return. So that, that eliminates a headache there. <clears throat> and then number seven, the tax savings may pay for the LLC itself. In other words, we can get possibly the government to pay for this thing. 
Now, here's how we can do that. First of all, if you already have yearly trading expenses, whether it's margin interest, uh, short locate fees, whatever it is, the refund you get from deducting those expenses could pay for the yearly LLC fee and the tax prep fee. Matter of fact, remember I said a little bit ago that uh, with the uh, multi-member LLC partnership and really the S corporation as well, you could then take the home office deduction without any questions whatsoever. That alone may pay for the extra LLC uh, fees. So that is something really to consider that you can get the government really to pay for this or pay for most of it. Um, <clears throat> and, and basically you got yourself an LLC for free. So here's how, here's, let me give you an example of that. First of all, assume a person lives in Alabama. Now the yearly LLC fee and the S court fee, it doesn't really matter, but that's about $125 per year. So every year you got to fork up $125 to stay registered, registered with the secretary of state's office. If you don't, then they delist you and all kinds of weird things can happen. Now, and also let's assume the tax prep fee for the partnership is $800 per year. And by the way, that's not our rate. I just picked that number out of the air. It may be a little bit high, but let's just use these numbers. So you've got $925 in extra fees for the year. <clears throat> Now, assume the person that we're talking about is in the 32% federal tax bracket and the 4% Alabama tax bracket. So they're basically paying 36% of their income in taxes. Now, <clears throat> let me also uh, mention here that the partnership return and the S-corp return are what are called pass-through entities. So all that income that's earned through the partnership or the S-corp doesn't get taxed there. It gets passed back to your personal tax return. So the S Corp and the partnership do not pay income taxes. You pay that on the personal side, just to clarify that. So you've got these $925 in extra fees if you live in, in Alabama. So this person needs $1,645 in trading expenses to get the government to pay for the LLC. In other words, if this person can deduct $1,645, hey, let's talk about home office deduction again. Home office deduction, you can write off a percentage of your mortgage interest or rent, real estate, percentage of your real estate taxes, percentage of your utilities, percentage of your insurance, percentage of your repairs and maintenance, percentage of HOA dues, or condo fees, percentage of lawn care, anything that goes into the property generally, you can write off a percentage of that. And so that $1,645 is easy to come up with. You can't take it anywhere. You can't take it on your personal side, probably. And so you pick this extra expense up when you get to the LLC. And then at that point, you could deduct it and then you get, um, the 36% tax break, break. So let's prove it. First of all, suppose our, tra our trader has $925 in LLC expenses and a tax rate of 36%. Now we also calculated that they have $1,645 in extra trading expenses. The refund would pay for the LLC. Here's how it works. Total deductible expenses. You got your $925 in the extra LLC expenses. You got your $1,645, let's say in home office deduction or other expenses, that's a total of $2,500, $2,570 that you have. And then that gets multiplied with the 36% tax break. And guess what? You're getting a $925 refund back from the state and federal government. So you just paid for the LLC. The government paid for the LLC. Uh, if you will. So it's really simple to do. Um, and, and, and most traders have those deductions just sitting around already. So that is really our plan. It's why we go to a multi-member LLC, sometimes an S corporation, but it really does pay for itself in the long run. All right, let's turn to our last topic here. It's the mark-to-market election. Now, this is an election 
with the IRS. You do have to file this with the IRS, unlike trader tax status. Trader tax status, you just do it. But this does have to be filed with the IRS for stocks and options traders. <clears throat> Any business entity can make this election. So you can make it a personally, you can make it in a partnership, you can make it in S corporation, you can make it in a C corporation. Um, <clears throat> so any entity can make the election, provided the qualifications are met. Now, again, it's my personal belief that those qualifications get relaxed if you're in an entity, doing this in an entity, but that is something we don't, we're not 100% certain about that. So just kind of keep that in mind. The mark-to-market election eliminates wash sale losses. So you actually end up paying taxes on what you earn. If you, any of you have been trading stocks and options for a while, you know there's this nasty little thing called wash sales where losses get deferred over time. And the idea is there if you trade the same thing over and over, same ticker symbol over and over again, the losses can get deferred down the road. And sometimes we'll cross the December 31st timeframe. Once they cross that, then you end up paying taxes this year instead of pay, getting the loss this year and hopefully get the loss next year. Mark to market does away with all that. It's actually a pure method. You actually pay tax on what you actually did. So <clears throat> Uh, the mark-to-mark -mark election does not look at individual transactions. Could care less what happens between January 1st and December 31st. It basically takes the uh, <clears throat> the value on January 1st, let's say it's $1,000. And on December 31st, that value was $1,500. It went up $500. That's what you pay tax on. Now, <clears throat> that's assuming that you didn't put money in or take money out, stuff like that. There have to be adjustments here. But the idea here is we compute an actual gain on what happens in your portfolio, and that's what you pay tax on. <clears throat> the election also eliminates the $3,000 loss limitation. Uh, <clears throat> under normal accounting rules, if you have, let's say, a $20,000 loss in your account, and you file capital loss of $20,000, you only get $3,000 on your tax return, and you got to carry the remaining $17,000 to next year. With mark to market, you can write the whole $20,000 off this year for whatever the current tax return. And so for the last two years, <clears throat> I've written off uh, in excess of $200,000 for some investors. Um, it's, it's, matter of fact, I've had one that wrote off over a million dollars this year. So <clears throat> you can write off that entire loss. Well, why is that a benefit? You get the refund back from the IRS now rather than having to wait for it over the next several years. And so you can take that refund and then you can actually apply it back to trading to, to recoup your losses. Now, here's the key. The election must be made at the beginning of the year <laughs> for individuals. The uh, mark-to-market election must be made between January 1st and April 15th. No exceptions to that. <laughs> so it is too late to do it for 2023. So your first opportunity is 2024. For existing businesses, businesses that have existed for since 2022, <clears throat> they have to do it at the beginning of the year also for S corporations and partnerships. The uh, election has to be done uh, between January 1st and, and March 15th, and C corporations between January 1st and April 15th. There is one exception. <clears throat> New entities can make that election immediately. And actually, they don't have to do it until the first tax return. So for example, let's suppose on July 1st, I set up an LLC, a multi-member LLC, and I want it to have the mark-to-market -mark election, <clears throat> I can do that immediately. So I would set up brand new trading accounts, start trading under the LLC, and I can have that mark-to-market -mark election right away. And then when I file the first return by March 15th, I can make that election then it, there. It's the only time that mark -to -mark, the mark-to-market -mark election is retroactive. And so if you're, if you're making a lot of money this year or, or and you want the mark-to-market election, the only way you're going to be able to do it for this year 
is to form an entity and the mark to market election will start the day that entity starts. <clears throat> and you can't go do reclassify anything before it, but you can certainly start with it. So time may be of the essence there. So let's kind of go back through everything again. Uh, trader tax status. It allows you to deduct trading and expenses if you qualify. <clears throat> you have to be really careful if you're doing this on a personal schedule C. Uh, not so much if you're doing it in a separate entity. Uh, number two, forming a, a multi-member LLC and an S corporation uh, provides asset protection, decreased audit scrutiny, and it could be free. You might be able to get the government to pay for it. So there are some definite benefits there. And the mark to market election allows stocks and options traders to pay tax on what was really earned. None of this deferred loss stuff going on. So it's a really a true way of taxation, quite frankly. <clears throat> so now let me put this caveat in here. Th these are ideas, they are strategies, but what fits your situation may not have been mentioned here. It's a good idea to get consultation first. Talk to somebody about this who knows what they're doing. And while I'm thinking about it, uh, if you do make the mark to market election, there are a few people, there's a, there's a handful of people in the United States who know how to do this on a tax return. Um, a lot of CPAs just look at this, their eyes glaze over and that's the end of it. They won't even touch it. Uh, so if you're going to do the mark to market election, make sure you find somebody that knows what they're doing with it, because you cannot just take it off the 1099 that you get from your uh, your broker every year. Uh, the numbers actually go back into the monthly statements. So you have to go back there. So you need to find somebody that knows what they're doing. And quite frankly, we are here to help in that regard. Um, this is the slide that I was going to ask about. And we'll certainly entertain some questions here in a little bit. Um, but our contact information, our website is right there. You can download that free ebook. I did put that into the chat. Hopefully, somebody that transferred that to everybody. Our phone number is 800 938 9513. Um, <clears throat> uh, somebody will answer that phone call if uh, and, and you tell them what you need and what you want to do, and we can figure it out. I will not be on the phone, quite frankly, because that's not what I do. I spend most of my time doing tax preparation and uh, some consults, um, but uh, but we do have people that know what they're doing and have been doing it for a long time. And certainly you can email us at learn at tradersaccounting.com. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this up on the screen for a little bit, and then I'm going to go into the chat and we can answer uh, some of the questions there because I know there's a lot of it, <clears throat> a lot of questions. So, so let me just kind of go back to the top. Um, okay. First one, interactive brokers, do they qualify for U.S. tax applications? Interactive brokers is located in the U.S. Uh, so <clears throat> if you are trading through interactive uh, brokers, you should be filing a U.S. tax return of some sort. Um, now that we've been through all this, let me tell you what we did for our uh, client our, in Canada or at least I mentioned to him, um, we told him to set up an LLC in, in a state, probably Wyoming that's got some pretty good asset protection laws. <clears throat> and it's going to be a multi-member LLC. And uh, doesn't matter whose broker is, but uh, he will be able to file that LLC in Wyoming and a U.S. tax return as a partnership. And then his we, we will do that return as Traders County will do that return for him. And then out of that will come what's called a K-1. Remember I said partnerships don't pay taxes, income taxes. So he'll get a K-1 and then he'll report that on his personal tax return that his CPA in Canada, who's good at cross-border taxation, uh, <clears throat> he'll just add that to the return quite simply and we'll take care of that. So, uh, so you know, if you are outside of the country, but you're trading through a U.S. broker, you do need some type of, uh, I would, I would su suggest an entity probably in the United States. Um, hi, I'm a U.S. resident, but citizen of Colombia and living in Colombia, I'm still bound to the U.S. tax rules. So yeah, <clears throat> if you are, uh, I would suggest, again, setting up some type of entity, don't use a single member LLC. Um, 
I would use a, a partnership. If you, you are married, um, then you have an automatic partner right there. Even if the spouse doesn't do anything, um, you got a partnership. And so uh, since you're living outside of the U.S., you could set that up in any state you want. I would recommend a tax-free state. Uh, Wyoming's got good asset protection laws, but you could use Florida or Texas as well. Um, <clears throat> while I'm thinking about the, those who are living in the United States, if you set up an entity, you better do it inside of the state uh, where you are actually living, unless <clears throat> you want to register in two states. Um, here's what can happen. Let's say I want to, I want to uh, set up a, an LLC in Wyoming, but I'm going to trade in California. We have, this is an actual situation we've talked about. If California finds out you're trading or running that LLC in California, then they're going to start hitting you up for tax returns and wondering why you're not registered as a foreign entity. So we do have some clients that register like in Wyoming and then register in California as a foreign entity. You can do that, but you've got two tax, two different uh, states that you have to make happy. So generally, we recommend you just set up in the state uh, that you're going to be li living in. Um, let's say over the past three years, one loses two hundred thousand, uh, not not with day trader status. Next year, I decide to file. <clears throat> ah, okay. So here's a situation: somebody loses two hundred thousand uh, dollars without marked market. That is a capital loss, and then decides to make the mark to market election. Now, the mark-to-mark -mark election starts at the day you make it, so it doesn't go backwards. And so that previous $200,000 that was lost still stays as a capital loss. And then I can actually create a problem for you because now with mark-to-mark -mark it, your gains are ordinary gains. So the ordinary gains cannot offset capital losses. So now you got a $200,000 capital loss that basically you're condemned to write off at 3,000 a year. So what we recommend to our clients in that case is you could still set up an entity, but do it under traditional accounting, make the gains, the capital gains that will offset the capital loss. And then once that capital loss is about used up or completely used up, then make that mark to market election because you don't want to have to write three the stuff off at 3000 a year for the next 60 something years it's just it doesn't work well um next question how does trading futures with the 60 40 tax work <clears throat> um futures have a different tax structure uh and certainly you can still do trader tax status and deduct your expenses we have a lot of clients that do that um <clears throat> and uh you could set up an entity and i would still recommend the entity thing we have clients, a lot of clients that do that. But for those of you who don't know, with futures, um, when you get profit or, or really lost, but we'll talk about profit right now. Let's say you make $1,000 in profit, 60% of that or $600 is a long-term capital gain. And 40%, $400 is a short-term capital gain. Well, why is that important? Well, with long-term capital gains, you can't pay over 20% uh, tax rate. That's the maximum. And more than likely, you're going to pay 15% or lower. It's either 0%, 15%, or 20%. It will not go over 20%. Futures are actually have a really, really good tax structure if you're going to be making money because 60% of that goes as a long-term capital gain and will never get taxed above 20%. So I would still recommend doing that in an LLC though. All right, we have a few minutes left. Um, so let's try to get through this, some of these questions here. Why not use a multi-present income beneficiary revocable living trust? The part of using a revocable living trust is you do not get a separate EIN is you have to have a separate EIN. The revocable trust bill, it really just attaches to you and it becomes you. And so uh, you can trade in that uh, situation, but you end up putting it back, back on your personal tax return again. All right, are you guys ready to shut me up? All right, well, let's see if... 
Um, thank you for your kind comments. Here's uh, one that says, uh, does it work with funded accounts? Maybe you, you trade for prop firms or uh, you will go to those new fancy prop, prop accounts. Does prop, could it work for that? Yeah, prop firms, no. It doesn't work for that. Prop firms are unique. And what you, the way you get paid is you are basically an independent contractor for the prop firm. So you're going to get a 1099 NEC. Uh, so there are no gains or losses or anything. The money you pull out of there is you are an independent contractor that is subject to self employment tax in addition to income tax. So that is a different structure and that's different advice altogether. Everything I've prevented really uh, pertains to trading your own money and investing your own money.